everyone, welcome back to Holy Hype. My name is Stav and I am your host. And today we're going to be going through the book of Mark chapter 11 together. Mark is one of the four gospels of the New Testament. It is the story of Jesus Christ. And we're, I think, a little more than halfway through the book of Mark. So I wanted to do Mark with everybody because it's the shortest of the gospels. And so I thought it would be cool to go through it with you guys, kind of show you how I study when I read the Bible especially if you're brand new and you haven't read the Bible. I want to make it really accessible, um, not intimidating, not scary. If I can read it, then so can you. So we're going to be in chapter 11 today. I hope you guys have been enjoying this series. We're getting to the point now where Jesus is getting closer to the, to the crucifixion. Things are starting to really um, heat up. And so let's go to Mark chapter 11, and I'm just going to read... That first bit, we'll read it together, and then we'll talk about it. This is a really important moment. I mean, all the moments are important, but this is what we call the triumphal entry. Uh, You might have heard of Palm Sunday. That's what's going on here. So let's start with verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, You will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And someone and some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and drew their cloaks threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. All right, this might be a story that's familiar to you guys. Maybe you've seen it in a movie or a show where Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. So let's go through it together. So Jesus is getting close to Jerusalem and he gives his disciples this order that they're going to find a cult and to bring it to him. And this just shows Jesus's sovereignty as God. He knows where the cult is. He knows where that the disciples might encounter someone who might ask them what they're doing. And just like he says it, that's what happens. And that must have only given the disciples that much more assurance of who Jesus was as the Messiah. The first thing I notice here is the obedience of the disciples. When Jesus tells them, hey, I need you to go get this colt, they just go and do it, right? So a colt is a young donkey, a young male donkey. That's called a colt. And there's a comparison here, a parallel to King Solomon. When he was crowned as king, he rode into Jerusalem on a colt. So there's a parallel here from the Old Testament to the New. And one thing that's really cool here is if we go to the book of Zechariah, which is way back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before this day where Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem on a colt, we see the prophecy that is foretelling this exact moment. So this is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Ah, It's right in there in the Old Testament. Another prophecy that is just showing everybody exactly what's going to happen, and Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies over and over again in his life. So cool. So he is now fulfilling that prophecy from way back hundreds of years ago. I've heard many sermons focusing on the donkey and how that was a sign of Christ's humility that he rode in on a donkey and not on some like big gigantic war horse or something really extravagant. It's a donkey, you know? And not only that, but Jesus was 
borrowing this donkey. It wasn't even his. He was borrowing it. And we see him borrow things throughout his life and ministry. Um, he borrowed a boat that he could preach on. He ate in a borrowed chamber. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. There was a lot of borrowing going on. And so I was reading Matthew Henry's commentary on this passage. And one thing that he said that I thought was really important to note is that as Christians, we shouldn't be ashamed to lend or borrow from one another. We're part of one family. And if someone's in need, the rest of us shouldn't be stingy. And we shouldn't be ashamed to ask either. I know that that's really hard because we have pride and we don't want others to know that we're lacking, especially in such a materialistic society and culture that we live in. We don't want people to think that we need anything or that we are without something. There's a pride there. And so it takes humility to borrow. And Jesus showed us that humility over and over. He wasn't ashamed to ask to borrow things. And it's even greater coming from him because he is the creator of everything, and yet he wasn't ashamed to borrow. So I think that's an important lesson to us as human beings and members of the body of Christ. Uh, so here we see these people celebrating because Jesus is coming into Jerusalem as the Messiah, and they are recognizing who he is. That's why they say, Blessed is the kingdom, the coming kingdom of our father, David, because Jesus was foretold to come. The Messiah was foretold to come from the line of King David. And now they're recognizing that this Messiah is right in front of them after all. And they say Hosanna in the highest. Um, I know I learned a ton of songs in Sunday school with the word Hosanna in it. And I never really thought about what that meant, but it actually means it's like a plea, like a pleading to God, like, please save us. Please deliver us. Because the Jews were waiting for Messiah to come and rescue them from the oppression that they were experiencing. They were waiting for this deliverance. And so they're saying, please deliver us. And they're talking about the Messiah. They're talking to the Messiah. And I think that there's a meaning there for all people because Jesus is the great deliverer of everybody Everyone who wants salvation, everyone who seeks after him will find him. And that is a deliverance that everybody needs. And it's available to all of us. Did my door just open? It's the breeze. It's the breeze. Okay. Then verse 11, it says, He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. So now he's in the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus knows what's coming he knows that he's going to be crucified and tortured and tormented uh, and that he's going to resurrect again as well. But he goes to Bethany, which is just a little bit outside of Jerusalem. And that's where we get to this really interesting little story about the fig tree. So this is in verse 12. Let's read 12 through 14. This part's really short. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Standing alone, these two verses, it's like, what is going on here? But this is actually a significant moment, and he comes back to this fig tree later. So, so it sounds like Jesus is hangry here, right? When I get hangry, I get a little grumpy. But he comes to this fig tree because he sees that there are leaves on it. And leaves mean that there should be fruit. If you see on the outside that the fig tree has leaves, you would expect that on the inside you could find some figs, right? I don't know if you guys have ever had figs, but I had figs back when I was in Greece years ago, and they're amazing. If you've never had a fig, they're really good. So coming up to a fig tree and not finding figs is kind of a disappointment. But there's a lesson here for what it means to be fruitful. There are passages in the Old Testament where God just expresses his disappointment as at the Israelites not bearing fruit. They're constantly unfaithful. And so in their unfaithfulness, he curses Israel. And it's kind of a parallel to what he's doing here with this unfruitful fig tree. So the next part about the temple pertains to this fig tree. So let's go on and read the next section. Verse 15, and they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, 
Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Jesus comes to the temple and he sees what's going on there. They have made it into a marketplace. It is no longer this reverential space where they pray and encounter the living God. It is a place that they're using to make money and to exploit people. And Jesus is just righteously angry at what he sees. And so he, he says a reference to Isaiah. It's Isaiah Chapter 56, verse 7, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. So he's saying, is it not written like this is written? The temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. And then he says, you have made it a den of robbers. So he's angry. And we see the response of the scribes and the chief priests. They're trying to find a way to kill him. And when I read this, I was trying to think of their motivations. Like, what are they thinking? Jesus comes into the temple and he has these huge crowds following him and people who adore him. And I think part of it is probably jealousy. And here we see it says they feared him because everyone was astonished at his teaching. Like, they don't understand who he is and what's going on. And they're afraid, probably jealous. And I'm sure their pride is hurt at all of this as well. So... Lots of just negative motivations here, and they just want to destroy him. But this part with the temple, you see what happens with the fig tree in the temple. So these people have uh, an appearance of being fruitful. They go to temple, they do all the right things, they follow the laws. Like we see him talk to the Pharisees over and over about this, that they have the appearance of righteousness, but inside... They are fruitless. There's no fruit. They have these beautiful leaves on the outside, but the tree itself, the roots are actually rotten. And I think that that really relates to that fig tree because he went to it because of the way it looked. It looked fruitful and then it wasn't. What a disappointment. And that is stemming from a rotten heart. So now in verse 20, we see what happened to the fig tree. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, might, may forgive you your trespasses. So now just imagine you're the disciples and you walk by that fig tree that Jesus cursed the day before, and it's withered away. And they remember what he said, and Peter's like, Rabbi, look, the fig tree's withered. And Jesus, instead of being like, yeah, that's crazy, or yeah, I knew it would because I told it to, he tells them, he gives them this lesson. Have faith in God. And then he says, whatever you ask for will be given to you if you have this faith. So he gives us this lesson about prayer. Just because I want something and I pray for it, does that mean that God is going to give it to me? Is that what this is saying? Because it sounds like this whole name it and claim it thing. Like, I want a million dollars. So if I pray for a million dollars, I believe God's going to give it to me, then he's going to give it to me. It is not so. So to understand prayer as a whole, let's look at how Jesus gave us an example of prayer. And this is in the book of Matthew. This is what we know as the Lord's Prayer. I'm sure a lot of you probably know it by heart or have heard it. So this is in Matthew chapter 6. And it's in verse 9. So he's giving the disciples on lesson, a lesson on how to pray. And this is not a formula as like you need to say these exact words. He's saying this is how you should pray. This is the template, if you will, for a prayer. He starts with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So he's starting by praising and worshiping God and acknowledging who he is. I'm currently reading this book called The Awe of God by John Bevere. It's very good. I'm actually listening to the audiobook. I don't know if you guys know this, but your library probably has an app where you can download free audiobooks. 
I used to use Audible for a while and then my free trial expired. I was like, how am I going to listen to audiobooks? But my library has an app where I just sign in with my library card, which is free, and I can listen to free audiobooks. So I've been listening to The Awe of God and the whole book is about the fear of the Lord and how important it is to have this fear. I mean, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord over and over again. Fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like there's so many verses about fearing God. It's such an important thing and something that we miss a lot and I think is missed in many churches in this country. So the first thing Jesus tells us is to glorify, glorify the Lord and stand in awe of who he is. Praise him. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will your will. This is honestly the part that I wanted to focus on because I think that one thing that happens with prayer, the more you pray, the closer you get to the Lord through reading his word and spending time with him, you will start to align your will with his will. And I'm no longer praying for things for myself, but I'm praying for things in his will, like things that are for his kingdom. It's no longer about like, I want this, I want that. The focus here is on God's will, not my own. We should strive for the things that God wants. And the closer we get to him, the more we understand what that is, what it means to work for his kingdom and towards his kingdom, and what to to pray for in his will. So he's not just saying like, ask and you'll get whatever you want. It all comes from being in right standing and in a right heart posture with God and in your relationship with him. Um, You are pulling for the same goal as God. You are working towards his kingdom. So it's important in this passage we see it's important to pray in his will. And also verse 25, it says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father who is in heaven may forgive you. We need to be in right standing with others. Like if you have an issue with a brother or sister, you need to go and fix it. First off, life is too short. Okay, unless this person is like extremely toxic or abusive or something. But if it's someone in the in the body of Christ, especially, we need to be united. And the New Testament talks about this constantly, that unity in the church, the body of believers. It's like that verse that says where Jesus says, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you in front of my father. Like we need to be in right standing with each other, especially if we're petitioning God for things, asking him to forgive us. We can't ask for forgiveness if we are holding forgiveness, withholding forgiveness from our brothers and sisters. All right, let's get to the next section. This is in verse 27. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Oh, (laughs) I love that part. Because he knows their hearts. He knows their motives. They're not asking because they genuinely don't know or that they genuinely want to know. They're asking because they're trying to trap him and entrap him and get him, get rid of him basically. Because he already showed them, if you go back, I think it was in Mark 2, he told them that he has the authority to forgive sins and they know that only God can forgive sins. Ergo, Jesus is God. But they won't accept who he is because of their hardened hearts. And so instead of answering them because he knows that they're not coming from a genuine place, he asks them this question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Because John the Baptist was coming and preparing the way, preparing people for the coming Messiah. So John would baptize people. And John had this huge following. Like people loved John. And it says in verse 32, they all held that John really was a prophet. So these leaders know that the people were followers of John and believed what he said. So if they acknowledge that John's baptism was from heaven, of God, then they had to acknowledge Christ because John declared Christ as the Messiah. So if they do that, 
then they're acknowledging that John was right and that Christ is who he says he is. And if they say it's from man, if John's baptism was from man, then the crowd will get angry. So they decide to say, uh, I don't know. But he knows they're just trying to trap him. So he's not going to give them an answer because they don't deserve one. They're not genuinely asking. And so once again, we see Jesus knows their hearts and he ain't got no time for that. So that's chapter 11. That was that one was kind of short. Um, we get into chapter 12 next time. Let me see how many chapters. And there are 16 chapters. So we have five more chapters to go. I hope you all enjoyed Mark chapter 11 and that you're enjoying this whole study. Let me know what you thought of this chapter below. If you have any comments or things that you noticed that I missed or any other information you want to share with us, I love reading the comments on these videos and I'll see you in the next one. Stay blessed. Bye.